Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is Buki on? Good afternoon, oh, Provost. Yes. She yes. is. Good afternoon, she sir. Is already. Yes. Sir. Mm. Um, yes. Um, sorry, joining a bit late. We are in the middle of court of governors. We have cancelled meetings this week, and so um, I have to be in U the University of Ibadan at five for the uh, meeting on labour uh, relations. So I will start off and then I will get into my car at some point. And um, the deputy provost will, if, I, if I'm unable to connect in transit the, um, between UCH and UI, the deputy provost will um, end the session. But I just want to say that um, once again, we invite, we welcome you all to this um, session. All, I wouldn't say all good things must come to an end because I would say all good things must lay a foundation for something that's going to grow into a bigger tree. So what we've been having in the last six sessions with Dr. Buki Owosheni, who is um, MBBS um, graduating class of 2004, is that she's been laying a foundation, taking us through a series of lectures, very, very exciting lectures, reflective, giving us time to reflect as we revise our curriculum. But not only that, she's also showing us that there are important portions of the curriculum that indeed somebody with her skill and background would find a great place. And not only that, we, she's also revealed to us that even in our biomedical communication center here in the College of Medicine, that as we also activate our academic programs, that we would need her input and her involvement in this process. So I would say all good things, this wonderful series has laid a foundation for greater things in which um, Dr. Buki Owosheni would participate in the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan. And so on that note, I also want to um, thank her as we start this um, six series. Um, for those of us who have not attended the um, one, two, three, four, five, we have put all the lectures on YouTube. And I'm going to ask um, Mr. Adedayo, I don't know if he's on, uh, to share the links to the, um, the various lectures on YouTube online, if you can share, the, share them in the chat box. But after this, we actually are going to do a release. We will do, I will ask Buki to summarize her lectures in a short, in a couple of maybe uh, one to three paragraphs. And then we will send out all the links to the lectures. We'll put it on the College of Medicine YouTube channel. And we will send it to all the, the College of Medicine University of um, Ibadan community. So as we take this last, session. I um, welcome you all. Like I said, Professor Lua Tosin is the co-host. Prof, do you want to say one or two words, sir, before we start? Yeah, Professor Lua Tosin is the chairman of the curriculum committee in the College of Medicine. So over to you, sir, for a couple, if you want to like to say a couple of words to us. Uh, well, I, I want to thank Buki for doing this series. It's been splendid. People have enjoyed it. Teachers, students, teachers of teachers, we've all looked you know, uh, forward to the Wednesday. And um, certainly, we have had a good time listening to the arts aspect of medicine. So really, I want to say thank you. And thank you, Provost, for the opportunity. And um, your classmate, one of our colleagues who uh, opened our eyes to this yeah. wonderful, um, wonderful lady. Thank you once again. So thank you very much. I hopefully I'll be able to comment at the end. But over to you, um, Buki, as you take us through 
today's session, which is a curriculum that supports a unified life. A curriculum that supports a unified life. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mubadu. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, um, Professor Lua Tussim. Um, it's just, it's been a pleasure. It's been my honor to um, just share some of the things I have learned that are a bit separate from my uh, clinical training at UCH, but I feel there is value in the intersection between um, academic training and the things we learn in other places. So it's just, it's been a joy to go through this. And I hope over the five weeks, previous weeks, um, I hope I've given everyone sort of um, a bit of food for thought and new ideas about things that will contribute to the curriculum. So we've started by talking about the unified life as a whole. And where we are now is at the final session, the sixth of six series, talking about a curriculum to support a unified life, because the whole aim of the, the series was actually talking about how this relates to the curriculum. But we began with the individual and we're ending with the curriculum. So I'll just quickly go over the previous weeks and have a think about um, what we talked about. Um, the first session, we talked about a unified force. We talked about the whole meaning of a unified self, and it's about bringing our, all our skills to bear, bringing ourselves to our study as a whole person, not leaving parts of ourselves behind and understanding that because there's so many things that can distract us and divide us, you know, our attention, bringing, being able to understand that all those things belong together and bringing them together is very useful and it makes us a stronger force in our endeavors. And then the second session, we talked about how the unified self leaves clues. And a major point was that we understood that there are clues about our personality, about our learning styles, found in the intersection between our varied ideas and our varied interests. And we, one of the points we talked about was paying attention to ourselves when we are in our flow state, when we are at our best, and not necessarily um, focusing only on the things that we do when the times are hard, when we're in the crucible, when things are a bit of a struggle. Our flow state is also important to study. And our third session was talking about frames, picture frames, and we used the uh, wood carving by Lamidi Fakaye to illustrate how sometimes the way we frame our stories might be outdated and might no longer suffice. And sometimes, just as Lamidi Fakaye did in his carving, we might need to break the frame. He broke the frame to allow for um, the drummer, the arm of the drummer and the drummer, and having a drummer within this particular carving transformed the entire picture. So it was worth breaking the frame um, to be able to bring this story to life. And with our stories and the story of the curriculum, the narrative of our student body and the things that uh, the College of Medicine wishes to achieve across all the disciplines, it might require changing a frame in order to bring a creative vision to life. And session four, we looked at the, the artist's tool called the hero's journey. And we looked at it as one of many tools that we can possibly use to chart our path forward, beginning to see that certain things have a repetitive way of acting, a repetitive way of showing up in our lives. And by the time we're able to chart a particular repeated journey, we're able to almost you know, see the future and we can look at the past and categorize um, our experience. And it's quite helpful in going forward. And one of the important parts of the hero's journey is having a mentor who breaks barriers, who helps us to, to cross over from the threshold to the, from the world that we are in into a new uncharted, scary place. And in session five, we continued about the unified stories and we talked about Sigmund Freud's paper, Remembering, Repeating and Working Through. We discussed how the process of remembering, identifying, paying enough attention to see that something is actually a repetition 
it can give that um, repetition meaning and it helps us to work through the meaning of that. So when we see that within the journey, that even though it looks chaotic, certain elements keep repeating, we're able to give those elements um, a meaning. So just like the hero's journey, we can see that the journey does progress around a seemingly logical um, state, even though the variables within the journey vary, the pattern is quite similar. So we know that the general journey repeats, but the variables within it are subject to change. And it's when we change those variables, then we begin to create better outcomes for ourselves. But at least understanding that there's a general pattern that often repeats itself can provide reassurance. So we, so the main, at the beginning, I promised to talk on six sessions with 12 ideas and with one method that will hold everything together. The single method of creating a unified life is to pay attention and pay attention to what? Pay attention first to oneself. Because the first idea is the idea that creativity is not about, can I draw, um, am I a poet? Creativity is simply perception. It's how we see things. Creativity is, is, is because we all have different ways of looking at things, different ways of experiencing things, different way of expressing things naturally. And that is creativity. And creativity must first be turned inward, not performative, not first of all um, to, to display or to conform. Creativity is first turned inward, perceiving oneself, we perceive ourselves, perceive our habits, perceive our the things that we like, the things that work for us and don't work for us before we can then turn it outward. And then the third idea was we look for a common thread. There's a tapestry that flows even through complicated patterns. There is usually a common thread that flows and that helps us to idea number four, to 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 focus on what we see because what we see becomes a story. So it shapes the narrative that we give and we can create lots of different narratives, even from the same events. So it's important that we see with creativity because we perceive in a particular way and it helps us to create a story that benefits us. And our story requires context, it requires a frame that can shrink, a frame that can expand. Sometimes we change those frames, we break those frames, sometimes we retell the story. And idea seven was looking at the hero's journey, where we look at the hero of a unified story will always have a mentor to help them cross the threshold. The hero's journey starts from the hero in a known world, going to a place that is unknown. And we, we talked about how we go through this so many times in our lives, the same journey. It's a journey that starts from starting from a known world, you go to an unknown world, there's a mentor that helps you to cross the threshold, then you have trials and tribulations, you have a setback, then you find allies who help you along the way, then something tries to stop you, and then you, are, you continue, then there's the dark night of despair, you're almost ready to give up, then you learn something new about yourself, learn something new about the process. And with the hero's journey ends back where you were before, but the hero is never the same again. On the per throughout the purpose of the journey, the hero has learned something new, has become a different person, a more mature person, and then the journey begins again. And because the journey always continues, so the journey of you know secondary school is, is, is one hero's journey. You start, you are afraid, you make friends, you experience setbacks, and then you finish secondary school wiser you're happy about the ex you know um, thankful of who you've become through the hardships and the good times um only to get to university and all of a sudden that journey starts again from the beginning you start you don't know where you are you're confused you're afraid and the journey continues but seeing that it's the same journey just with different variables is reassuring and it helps us to begin to tweak the variables. And idea number eight was how we want this journey to be complete. We want it to be a, a unified journey that leads to a rational end where we, we emerge um, changed for the better. And then nine and 10, we're talking about Sigmund Freud and how repetition creates meaning. And every time we remember events and we repeat them within that journey, we have the opportunity to change the elements within that journey. So we can introduce variation. So 
so we can shorten the, 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 the maybe the, the period of being afraid. We can shorten that. Uh, maybe previously it took us months to find a mentor. Now that we know that the journey is a particular way, we need a mentor. We can look for a mentor straight away. So we can change the variables in the journey, how long each phase lasts, because we know the general pattern of things. So the curriculum, now looking at the curriculum review, it's about supporting a unified life. And there are many, many different models and many ways of looking at curriculum reviews. And, and um, most of them start with, with thinking rather than just jumping straight into beginning to review the curriculum. It starts with goals. It starts with a vision. It starts with philosophy, sort of this is what we want to do. This is what we think. This is what we want to achieve. Or it could start with a needs assessment. These are the gaps that we've identified. Start with the situation analysis. Before pen goes to paper, there are lots of questions that are asked. And that is why this set series of lectures started, because that's part of the process, part of the process of asking questions before the practical part of really changing the curriculum. And that's what we're already doing. Um, we ask questions, we think about new ideas, we ask you know, for opinions, there are conversations that happen. And when we do that, we gain perspective. So I like this model, the one with the red circle, it says the first step on that one says um, gain perspective. And that's wonderful because we talked about creativity as simply being a way of perception and gaining, um, gaining perspective is a creative process, looking at things in different ways, asking different kinds of questions. And that's how, and that's what we're beginning with. So um, to illustrate the point I have for this week, I'm going to um, call upon the work of this man. I don't know if anybody knows who this is, but this is uh, Cyprian Equency. And he was born in 1921, um, died in 2007. And we know his most famous works is, you know, he has the vast collection of writing because he started writing as early as the 1950s and uh, most famous for um, The Passport of Malam Ilya, Jaguanana, uh, He Wrote Burning Grass. But today the book I'm actually interested in is one of his less common books and it is People of the City. Now, People of the City is part of the African Writers series. And it, I don't know, if, uh, these books, I don't think that they're not really published in this format any, anymore, but when I was in secondary school, and I'm sure decades before then, these books, orange books, very recognizable, very distinguishable, everywhere was orange in the literature classes. That was the Heinemann African Writer Series. Um, and the first book in the series was Things Fall Apart. Um, so Brady Quincy wrote book two in the series, which was Burning Grass and book five. It's not ordered um, um, chronologically because he actually wrote People of the City before he wrote Things Fall Apart. Um, so he, he published it for the first time in 1954, but it became part of this series in 1963. And it tells about, um, it's a story of a musician, Amusa Songo, he's a, he's a musician, he's a journalist, and he just lives in this big city, and the city was never named, but from the way they describe the city, we know it's Lagos, but he lives in this really big, complicated city, and, and he lives in this big, complicated city, old city, and it's all about how he, how he navigates his way through chaos um, to reach his goals. Um, the, I have particular interest in the African Writer Series. I am working on, um, this is the 60th anniversary, 60th year anniversary of the series. Um, and um, to support the 60th anniversary, so I'm curating readings, lectures, and talks on these books. Um, I have a copy of People of the City. Um, actually, I like to collect the African Writer Series. I try to get as close to um, the first editions as I can, like the first edition was 1963, but the cop this is a photo of the copy I have. Um, my copy is 1964. Um, I just like to collect the old books and they're actually quite valuable. For example, if you, you know, if you check your um, old, if you check your storeroom or you check your father's or grandfather's <laughs> storeroom, you might find, if you find yourself with a, a first edition of Things Fall Apart by Chino Achebe, for example, you know, it will go for about 
maybe 2 million naira on auction. So these books are actually quite valuable, uh, not just for the money, but also for a, a part of history. Um, one of my favorite things to do is, um, I, like this is my copy now, I look at the book, it was bought by somebody in August 1965. And it was bought in Yaba when phone numbers were merely five digits. So it's like holding on to a particular piece of history. So anyone who is ever interested in you know, the, old, the old classics, I would recommend looking at the series. It's actually a fantastic read. Um, so, um, so this book was written um, and, and he used this book to explain cities as a metaphor. So he, he was writing about a man, but he wrote about a city and he used the city as a metaphor for the upheaval in this man's life. So this man would go through all sorts of trials and problems and he'd reflect these trials and problems in the hustle and the bustle of the city, the chaos of the city. Um, the man would have you know, really lovely experiences. And Equency would reflect this again in the lovely experiences in the city. So talking about a city as a metaphor. So I've talked about Cipra and Equency's work um, in People of the City. And later on afterwards, I will talk again about how Plato as well, that's a bust seeming to represent Plato, um, how Plato in his, um, in his writing about Socrates also used the city as a metaphor. And I'm going to compare and contrast that. It might seem, we might say, what does the city have to do with the curriculum? What does the city have to do with the person? You know, are we going on a tangent? But I'll just say, bear with me, it will all come back um, to the center. So Quincy in his book wrote about the city as a place of both love and chaos, both opportunity and struggle. And we can all agree that life is a bit like that. There's opportunity as well as struggle. There's up as well as down. And that's, that's always part of the journey. So the beginning of the book, the quotes he wrote is, a, is sort of the introduction to the book. It writes how the city attracts all types and how the unwary must suffer from ignorance of its ways. So he's talking about Lagos, and we know when you're in Lagos, you know, you shine eye, you, 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 there is this knowledge one requires to survive the busy city. And without that kind of knowledge, one suffers from ignorance of its ways. Why? Because we don't know where we're going. And that's the same thing with the journeys we take, the journey of the individual learning a new skill, the same thing as the journey of someone having to pass through academic study. That's the same thing as a journey of a curriculum because what the curriculum actually does, it's a very ordered process that helps to navigate through something that, might, that probably seems very chaotic to, um, to students. The curriculum is wide. The, 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 the classes are almost infinite, the teachings, are, there are so many, and it seems as if, can I catch up? But having a particular body of work that holds all these things together in a structure helps to almost deliver people from ignorance. So understanding that the ignorance actually causes a lot of suffering um, is actually important. And that's you know, where the curriculum comes in and provides structure to what seems massive, to what seems loud and chaotic and very frightening. It provides this structure that is really, that's required. So that takes me to idea 11. Now, when there's a confusing process, there's a rhythm to it. And, and that is sort of one of the goals of, 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 of a curriculum review, to bring things back to the center, like to the people who it's designed for, the whole process might seem very, the whole process of study might seem very overwhelming, but having this common core to come back to brings a sense of rhythm to a process that seems not to have any sort of structure, but it does. Um, and it's the same thing as the hero's journey, for example, the journey, the way we journey through life, it may seem as if all our lives are very different. Your life is so different from mine. Our experiences are different. You'll say that you are nothing like me. I'm nothing like you. But the fact of the matter is when we come back to the hero's journey, we see that actually on a basic level, we are going through the same journey. We start out unsure of ourselves. We learn a new skill. People help us along the way. We have setbacks. Our, the arc of the narrative is quite similar. And so it's the same thing, understanding that there is, there is a rhythm. There is, there is a curriculum. There is structure behind this. Um, so, so there is guidance. 
So part of the benefit of having this guidance and having this structure means that we can call on other things. So having this curriculum ahead of us, we can look to other parts of these ideas. We can look to you know a mentor who's who's gone through the curriculum, who understands the whole structure of the curriculum better than us to guide us through the way. So the next um, slide, we're going to look at um, a... I did an audio recording, and that's one of the things I do for most of the African Writer Series. I will record the first page. So it's a recording of an audio recording of the first page, and it just kind of describes um, a city. And it's just describing, you know, the highs and the lows of a city. And by looking at the different parts of, of the city, it's just trying to give a flavor of, of what the city feels like. And this will come in handy when we start to look at Plato in his arguments, um, in the arguments he writes, in Socrates' arguments that he writes um, in his books. So this is um, People of the City. And this is the first page. You will have to excuse a Quincy because... See, Fred Quentin's 1950s writing is not exactly what we would write today. Um, there are certain ideas of, um, of metaphor, ideas of the, the male gaze, ideas of female representation. So, but the book still has its charms, and I would, I would encourage anyone to read it because it's actually a very charming story. So this is the first page, a part of the first page. Most girls in the Most girls in the famous West African city which shall be famous. Never will dress twenty men in the street. There lived the most colorful and eligible young bachelor by name, Abusa Sunday. In addition to being crime reporter for the West African sensation, Songo, in his spare time, led a dance band that laid the calypsos and the concomas in the only way that delighted the hearts of the city. Husbands who lived near the All Language Club knew with deep irritation how their wives would, on hearing Songo's music, drop their knitting or sewing and wiggle their hips, shoulders, and breasts sighing with the nostalgia of musty nights years ago when lovers' eyes were warm on their faces. Nights that could now, with the home and family, while those who as yet had found no man would twist their hips alluringly before admiring eyes, tempting, tantalizing. Promising much, but giving little, basking in the vanity of being desired. Women, Songo could have had his pick from the silk clad ones who wore lipstick in the European manner and smelled of scent in the warm air to the more ample, less sophisticated ones in the big sleeved velvet blouses that feminized the woman. Songo's one desire in this city is peace and the desire to forge ahead. No one would believe this knowing the kind of life he led. But beneath this gay exterior lay a nature serious and determined to carve for itself a place of renown in this city of opportunities. So that was um, Cyprian Ekrenzi's, um People of the City. That was the first page. So on the first, he describes he describes a very happy man. You know, he plays the music and, you know, it's all about the parties and everything. But underneath his core, he was actually a very, very determined person living in a very, very bubbling and thriving environment. There was so much going on. And the most important thing to him was the survival in the city, was making progress in the city in spite of all the distractions. And for me, that kind of mirrors life, mirrors life in whatever endeavor we're working on. Um, it mirrors life in the sense where we, 
we're trying to achieve a particular thing, but at the same time, there's so many things holding us back. We have diverse interests. He was a journalist. He wanted to be a very successful journalist, but at the same time, he was a musician. He played the trumpet, um, played the trumpet at a, in, in a band at night. So these different parts of him warring against each other and all against the backdrop of a, of a busy city. So for me, that's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like UCH. There's so much going on. There's so many parts of us. Um, so many, so many, there's the academic life, there's the hostel life, there's family life. There's so many parts and elements to life, all warring for our attention. And, you know, it's a bit like, you know, being in a city and having to decide priorities again, again and again. So I'm going to compare that to, um, said I would compare Quincy's writing to Plato's. Now, and, and it's, I'm just comparing the city and the way they describe the city as a metaphor. So now Plato's Republic, it wasn't anything Plato said. He just wrote a sort of um, an account of Socrates' arguments. And in the Republic, one of the chapters in it is called Analogy of the City and the Soul. And he used the city to describe a person and he used the city to describe a soul. Um, in the early parts of his of that work, he described um, so in the early parts. Oops, sorry. In the early parts of that work, he described um, the city in a political sense. So he said, um, okay, the city is like a person. These are the different parts of a person, and this is the way a city needs to operate in order for that city to be happy. And he described a person as well. And he said, this is the way a person needs to operate in order for the person to be happy. So he made, um, he made connections with it. And these are the similar connections that I make with Cipriani Quincy's People of the City. And one thing that he talked about was the tripartite soul. And that's simply the soul of three parts. He divided it into three parts and just as, he used it to illustrate the city in three parts, the person in three parts. And I like the illustration um, simply because it underlies a lot of what we're talking about. Now, there are arguments about, you know, the you know, disagreements about Plato's arguments and how uh, accurate it is and whether the analogy is accurate or not. But if I leave that aside for a minute and I just take it on a basic level about a soul being divided and about a city being divided, then we can begin to see parallels with ourselves. So Plato described, well, Socrates, uh, they always call it Plato, but all these words are supposed to be uh, attributed to Socrates. So what Socrates described in his arguments was, he talked about a city in several parts, a soul in several parts. And it's similar to what we've been talking about because we said it's not linear. You cannot separate a city sharply. If we remember the uh, Erabo and Mokbai's um, painting, the, night, the um, Yin and Yang, 1963 painting. Let's see if I can find it. This was the image we looked at in, 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 in the first week, and it's Yin and Yang, and it was about Erabo and Mokbai's work. A lot of his work focused on dualism, and trying to look at the differences. You know, he had paintings like black and white, yin and yang. And in yin and yang, he has things that are opposing. There's a blue opposing the red. And at the place where both of them meet, there is actually a different color. There's different shades. There are different hues. Where different things meet, you can't really, the lines might not be as sharp. And there is something to be said, something to be found in the intersection, in the beauty of it. So when you have a city, you, can't, you can say, yes, a city is in multiple parts, but you can't especially delineate these parts um, too sharply. A city is not linear. A person is not linear. So the three parts of the soul, which, which is described by Socrates, is rational part and the spirited part and the appetite, uh, appetitive part. And when we look at these, these um the different drives and the body and the loves, the virtue, the vice, all within it. We can agree to some extent and say, yes, there are different parts of the body. There are different parts. You know, there's the logical side, the truth and wisdom. There's the spirited part that's covered by emotion and it wants certain things. It's motivated by, you know, honor and courage. It's a very emotional side. And then there's just the appetites that sometimes get us in trouble, but we can't live without them as well. So it's having all these things in balance. And 
Socrates talked about the rational side as being the kings and the guardians, and he talked about the spirited side as being those are the soldiers, the auxiliaries that keep everybody in check, and the appetitive part was the merchants and the workers. So what's my point with all this? So just like Equensi's side, there are many parts to the city. There is the part of the city where um, Amusa Songo plays the, 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 plays the trumpet in a jazz band and makes them dance and they're so excited. And then he's still in that same city, that that city, you know, makes people suffer if they don't know what's going on, if they're unwary, if they're not paying attention, if, if, they, if they have no one to help them. It's that same city. So it's the happy city and it's still and it's a silver city that, you know, has its issues. So without the unified parts, according to Socrates, a city is not at peace. If these sides are not balanced, the rational side, the spirited side, the appetitive part, if these parts are not balanced, then there can be no peace. And he used it to explain the politics of the day, saying, you know, you have to have the guardians and the kings, um, and you just, they must be in balance with the soldiers. The soldiers must be in balance with the workers. If you don't have soldiers in balance with workers, what do you have? You have revolts. If you don't have kings in balance with soldiers, what do you have? You know, you have a coup. So there must be this constant balance, which is always changing, but that is what is required for the city to be at peace. In fact, Socrates says, he says the philosopher, the king must become a philosopher or a philosopher must become a king. That's the only person that can actually rule this idea, ideal city that wants to be at peace. Um, and he said that, that and the, the philosopher who would become king and the king who become a philosopher must be happy in their private and public life if they want to be whole. So they can't be split. They can't have this separation between private life and public life. They are all philosopher, all king, all at the same time. So all these parts are separate that at the same time together. And that is what I refer to as the unified life, the unified soul. And supporting that is the work of the curriculum. Equency City is a unified city. It has, it's an awful city with lots of trouble. And it's a fantastic city where there's a jazz band and there are people who absolutely enjoyed the nightlife. And it's that same city. So that's the same kind of person we are creating that curriculum for, where every part works. So if our student is the philosopher king, we expect that student to have a happy private life and public life if they're to discharge their duties properly. So in looking at the curriculum, one can look at, um, I say it's not related to, um, you know, it's not related to the curriculum or my academic, you know, study on teaching, but one can just use it as an analogy and look at all these parts and says, okay, do, does, does the curriculum allow for the spirited side of study? Like I remember the, my favorite thing to read and I memorized almost all of it was the, um, I think the Oxford hand, that, that little handbook, the Oxford handbook of clinical medicine. They had so many patient stories in it. They had so many aphorisms. For me, that was the most beautiful book I ever had because it appealed to the spirited side. It appealed to the emotion that would drive my knowledge. For me, it's a patient story that will make me want to study. I did not want to study for the sake of studying or for the sake of knowing it or for the sake of um, you know, being the best in any subject. None of that appealed to me. Um, that was not my drive, but a, a story, a patient story, a patient narrative, um, a, a narrative about change and about impact is actually what would drive um, my will to study. And so we're all different. Some people are people are different. Some people are very, very structural, analytical. Their drive comes from, you know, I this is this is this is the body of work and I want to finish it. They would like, you know, if they have a curriculum printed out, they won't rest until it's finished. That's how they're, you know, driven. So it's all about looking at the different types, the different drives, you know, the different things that appeal to people and saying, asking the questions, are we accounting? for these unconventional um, methods of learning? Are we accounting for these other avenues of motivation? So there's a part in the, um, in, uh, the, in the Pateman Plato's Republic, which I found very interesting. And it was one of Socrates' students. And he says that here, 
Adamantus interposed and he was asking Socrates, okay, what defense will you make, Socrates, if anyone protests that you are not making the men of this class particularly happy? So what he meant, the previous argument, Socrates had said, you know, a city described, you know, he described a city um, and he said a just city will have these types of classes. You have the ruling class, you have workers, you know, you have the soldiers and, you know, this is what they need to do for the city to be happy, for the city to be prosperous, for the city to be just. And Adamantus says, OK, so what if you have the, you know, the maybe the, the rich and if you're if something that you're doing you're not making people of this particular class happy or what would you do if you know you're not making the soldiers happy and socrates response was this he says our object in the construction of our state is not to make any one class preeminently happy but to make the whole state as happy as it can be made and then that looks at the city, even though it has its different parts, it has this, the, the, the working, the worker class, even though it has the, uh, the soldiers, it has the rich, it has the king, the philosopher king, all the different classes he talked about. He said, well, the, the point of the whole thing is that not that any one class is preeminently happy, and it's all about the unified whole. It's looking at these divisions as one thing. And that brings me to the final point, idea 12, can we make the whole person happy? Now that might seem like a trite statement, but I will say it in the same way sort of Socrates said it in the sense that can, can anyone make anyone happy? So when you look at the city and you say the city is a happy city, it's, you can't say that because at any one time, three people are, are not happy in the city or, you know, 3% of your population are not happy, 10% of your population are not happy, but you would still say, well, overall, the city is happy. So looking at it from that perspective, that on the whole, looking at the whole thing, because give or take, certain parts will have certain ups and downs as we go along. But when the aim is to make the whole city happy, then there are different decisions that can be made. If we look at the city and we say, um, we're focused on the soldiers because if we don't focus on them, they'll do this. Or we're focused on the workers because if we don't you know, do this, you know, this will happen. Or we're focused on the philosopher king. Otherwise this happens. Then our decisions will be very different from having a vision where the vision states to make the whole person as happy as we possibly can overall. And that just means that when we're reviewing the curriculum, when we're reviewing ourselves, our habits, our interests, our priorities, personally, we look at the whole thing. We look at all the interests together. We don't say, for example, I, I want to start a new hobby and I want to do it for two hours a day. The natural thing is to look at all the other parts of you. Will the other parts of me suffer? Will the other parts of me, will the, what, what will the repercussions be on the other parts? And that's the part of the thing with the curriculum towards a unified self is the questions that we're asking now and the line of thinking and inquiry we're asking about creativity is looking at ways in which we can review the curriculum while taking into account different aspects of student life. So finally, it's a guiding vision and it's a useful question to ask, does this contribute to a unified self? So as we review the curriculum or as we review personally, you know, review things that we do generally, we ask ourselves, does this contribute to our unified self or does it divide us even further? You know, how do we take one part of ourselves? How do we take our, you know, our interests and our hobbies? How do we apply it? to work or, or other parts of our lives? How do we merge these things? Um, so that's a guiding vision. And I think that's a very useful question to ask and to keep reiteratively asking, knowing that the goal is for the whole city to be as happy as it possibly can be, rather than satisfying only one part, the student part, the academic part, and leaving the other parts out in the sun to dry. We found that, you know, in the creative process, actually the parts we're ignoring actually contribute to our progress in other aspects.
So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you for attending. This is the sixth series. I know there are some people who've attended all six. Thank you so much for uh, your time. And I hope, you know, I've given you some food for thoughts. The, um, the YouTube channel for the rest of the videos are in the, um, are in the links. I would like to thank the biomedical, communica the biomedical communications unit um, and the staff. Uh, thank you so much for your support and thank you for attending these. Um, and I hope to do more great work with you in the future. I'd like to thank Professor Lua Tosin for, for leading the curriculum review and for his encouragement and the opportunity to present um, this kind of work. And I thank um, Professor Omigodo as well for her creative vision um, in, in bringing this series to come together. And also I thank Dr. Mary Ugala here as well, who actually saw my videos and she realized that actually this might be something that's useful for the college and she facilitated the introductions. And from there, that's how we came up with this. So thank you so much. Um, so in conclusion, you know, we have our six sessions, the 12 ideas. Um, and if you don't remember anything from these sessions, the one thing we can always take away is the method. And the one method is to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. It's okay to pay attention to ourselves, pay attention to how we work best. Um, and in, in revising the curriculum, paying attention to the needs um, and our creative vision will go a long way. Thank you very much. Um, and if anyone has any questions or comments, I will be happy to take them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Dr. Buki Oshene. I, I want to apologize first by uh, you know, uh, expressing that I kind of uh, missed most of your sessions. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Professor Adeni. I'm the Deputy Provost of the College of Medicine. Um, most of your sessions I would probably join to start, and then uh, I will have to attend another meeting and um, just to probably represent the Provost and all that. So, um, but incidentally, today uh, the Provost is on the other way, so she has to leave. And then um, I have to be forced to, to stay, which I think is very lovely for me. At least uh, I've had the opportunity of listening to you throughout the entire session today for the first time. With the other previous sessions, I will come in, then leave for another meeting or, and so on. So I, I really apologize, but all the same, I'm very delighted to have been able to be part of the session today. And of course, I would like to appreciate all the, uh, our colleagues from all across the globe who have um, attended the sessions in the past and even today. Uh, I know that there have been very uh, robust sessions across the uh, six uh, uh, sessions. So um, without wasting so much time, I know that the provost may not necessarily be able to speak at this time because she's in transit to a very important meeting that is starting at five. So um, I will just stand in for her briefly. And then, um, like you have just said, we would like to have um, questions and comments. And, um, but I must say that you have been, you have displayed a lot of uh, uh, multiple talents, which, which is quite commendable. And uh, this is an, an eye opener, I'm sure, to so many of our students who have uh, been very uh, religious and um, attending this um, series. Certainly, the, the sky is always the limit for every professional. We can all go on and on and on to explore all the several talents that are inherent in us. But a lot of times, we are unable to, to, to uh, pick up the courage to follow other uh, paths in our uh, career line. So this is quite commendable and um, we are very grateful for this. Let me start uh, from um, our teacher, Professor 
Uluwatosin, the chairman of the uh, curriculum committee of the College of Medicine, if he has um, comments or questions. Then I know that um, at the beginning of the meeting, I, I noticed uh, Professor Mokodion, uh, Professor Fulashadio Mokodion was on board. I'm not sure if she's still, I, I don't know if she's still here. On board. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, ma. <laughs> yes, ma. So um, please, uh, let's have questions or comments, and um, I'm sure Dr. Ocean is always ever ready to, to respond to them. Thank you, sir. So much. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. And in particular, I want to thank Buki, just uh, her usual self. Throughout the series, we've had very interesting presentations. And I'm happy that um, it's not only the faculty in the university that attended students, probably a few attended today. I'm not sure why, perhaps, um, some of them and many of them are moving towards their uh, final exam and um, end of posting exam or something. But I note that uh, there are, just as the deputy provost said, um, alumni from different parts of the world. It's been a very interesting series. And um, just as has been posted by some of the, um, the listeners, um, we, we, it's been enlightening. One thing that is unique about the present series that is curriculum review is that there's going to be a review across board. So it's not just for medical students only, it's going to be for all the courses um, under the College of Medicine. And I noticed that this series of lecture actually covers every aspect in the medical field. And I'm really very delighted that um, it has happened so. Just as Dr. Odole posted, it is something that tries to put the unified self together. And um, curriculum, as has been defined, is um, something that puts a reading that will certainly um, reduce or remove the confusion uh, amongst the uh, participants, that is the people of the city. It's been great. And I must say that uh, we've had wonderful times right through the series. I will leave room for some questions and uh, comments uh, if there are any. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Um, over back to the Deputy Provost, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for, for your comments. And um, like you said, uh, I can see Professor Mokodios' hand is up. So over to you, ma. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Provost. And um, good to be on this program. This is my first time attending. Dr. Wusheni, um, well done. She's, she's, she's smiling. It's very good to hear from our graduates after they've gone out and to find out what they're doing and how they're faring. And I want to appreciate you for coming back to tell us how you're doing. Obviously, you're doing very well. Um, you've gone into the arts. You must have the arts, like some of us who had some of the arts in us, but the science was the drive in our, in our own generation. You had to be a doctor to prove yourself that you were good. And if you had any artistic or any art, in, art inclined um, tendency, you kind of left it aside, you know, no more writing of poems and things like that once you got into medical school. <laughs> Even though we had those giftings when we were in secondary school. Now, what I, what I actually want you to tell us um, is how do you think our curriculum can make room for these other aspects? Because you've given us uh, about the city and how um, the other aspect, the rational, I remember that one. I can't remember the other two aspects like the soul or something. You know, how can the curriculum, apart from giving us, apart from us, what we do as didactic lectures, even practicals, um, sometimes even tutorials and things, what else can we do? take cognizance of these 
aspect of students' lives and needs. And you know, I've seen well, there's one of our students recently, the last two years, who has gone out there to do some, some exploits that took him to CNN. I can't remember Imo, Imo, Imo Ye or somebody like that. I remember him as a medical student. And we have such gifts among our students, which are not necessarily medical, but they are an expression of the gifts that God has put in their lives. How can we help our students to build on these giftings that they have, as well as being doctors? You know, many years ago, you had doctors who were gifted um, pianists, you know, they used to play very uh, violin and all of that, and they were still good clinicians. So we would like to groom holistic doctors, more holistic doctors, not so much purely academic and, you know, um, academically focused only, but would be able to develop other areas of, of their lives. What specifically can you give us as examples of how our curriculum can be modified to take this in and to help us for future generation of students? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Mokodian. Thank you for attending. Um, it's a very good question, and, and it's a vital one. Um, it's, it's so important that the arts are not left out. Uh, I remember my first medicine posting, I can't remember. I had my first posting, one clinical posting, and the first patient I had was told we were all assigned patients to clerk, and she said, um, I was supposed to clerk this person. So, you know, we all left. I came back in the evening, ready to clerk my patient, like a good student. And I got to the ward and she was there. She, she had cancer, um, renal cancer, it had, it had metastasized. She was very, very poorly in a very bad way. And she had a kidney dish next to her and she was just coughing up blood into that kidney dish. And I greeted her, you know, ready to try, you know, my naive way to try to ask questions, nervous. And she looked at me and, you know, she said, doctor, the way she thinks every medical student is a doctor, doctor, am I going to die? That was the first question I had. And I'm 19 years old. How do I answer that kind of question? Did my education prepare me to answer that kind of question, to deal with that kind of question? And these are the kinds of things that the curriculum can decide. We need space for this. And arts is an excellent way of processing this. Because if I'm left alone to deal with a patient who is telling me, am I going to die? And I have no help to process, the, I'm, I'm walking into grief. I can't help her through grief. And I can't even reflectively discuss that grief, because the questions we're supposed to ask is, you know, about the insertion of the muscle and you know, differential diagnosis. So the curriculum has room for the other parts of, 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 of the experience. Now, regarding things like the arts, I'll say UCH was fantastic for, for the arts, you know, with Symphonia that's still running. It's a wonderful organization. Lots of, you know, plays, lots of, I think so many doctors, you'll find so many novelists, so many poets, are, are, are doctors. It's, it's, it's as if it, it, it comes together and giving room for that. I think because the arts just helps doctors to process things. To, to, it helps with the empathy. It helps with service. And when we say, let's stop doing this in, in the pursuit of medicine alone, we then end up with doctors that are not as wholehearted as they are designed to be, if that is their natural inclination. So to answer directly, how does the curriculum address this? The curriculum, first of all, says these are the I, these are the gaps, and this is where we can create room. So the didactic lectures lectures are required; they are there. They take up space. So then we have to say, what what room is there? Is there space in teachings? Do do we have what format are we going to use? And it will be part of an iterative process in the sense that we're going to test so many things out. Like I have an I like one of like so many ideas, you know, running through my brain, you know, talking with Professor Omigbodo. You know, an example is, you know, preclinical students, for example. You give everybody a piece of paper, have some crayons or markers there, you know, put some put up a, a painting or something on a on a on a on a on a, on a projector. And then you just ask everybody, okay, draw 
And they're all having fun. They will love it. They all draw, laugh at each other's paintings, say, oh, yours is rubbish, mine is good. And at the end of it, then you have a discussion. It's just 80, 10 minutes. You say, whose is good? You know, everyone will say, oh, this person's is good. This is perfect. Then you start to discuss what makes a good painting. Because what we are trying to tell them is that this is not medicine or dye. This is not um, nursing or dye. This is not you know, the sciences or human nutrition or that this is that there are options in life. Then we start to begin to, ex- to, 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 to help them to discuss perfection. Because the last, last week we talked about this whole idea of um, the hero's journey and the journey through um, the medical sciences about how we all start, but we all may end up somewhere else. You know, have we had that conversation at the beginning saying these are the options and if, if, if things don't go to plan, these are the other options and this is the backup. And the backup can also be beautiful. And using art, a short, it's, it, cannot, it doesn't take more than 20 minutes, having them fool around drawing things and explaining actually that art has no format. You then show them, you know, all these paintings, the ones that look beautiful, the Mona Lisa, then you show them the squiggly ones that seem to look strange but are actually very, very valuable parts of artwork. Then they start to begin to think that actually this idea of perfection that we see, you know, it comes in many parts. So that's one way of supporting. Ways of supporting, you know, people who are inclined to poetry, people who are inclined to writing, is there a way of reflection? Workshops, because we do have these workshops and the reflective process for, for, for residents and consultants, and you have your mentors and the formal processes of reflection. But you know, for students, who's reflecting with them the horrific things they see on the world? Who's helping them to process um, and the, the challenges they go through? I saw that woman, I couldn't clerk her, but I couldn't tell anyone that I couldn't clerk her because I didn't feel anyone would be sympathetic to me. I, I, it was my, I just felt compassionately. I couldn't collect someone who could barely breathe. So do we have the other news for this, um, for this conversation, for this, it would be able to say, to have this free conversation to say, uh, this, is, this is the situation. And, and for me, emotionally, it was very difficult. And someone guiding me through that process saying, this is what I do when I'm in this situation. I've been where you are, and this is this is how I go through. So there are many ways of um, of, of 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 doing that through 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 art, through other interests, and sometimes even asking students themselves in small groups. You know what 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 would be helpful? What are their hobbies? What are their interests? Um, sometimes these way these are also ways of 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 of, of teaching um, teaching doesn't always happen sitting down around the table there are many other ways of um, of teaching um they, like some of these tools are used for children and we forget them when people are older like there are some children who you know they hold a pen they sit down they hold a pen and then they shake and then they are scared but if music is playing in the background or people are talking about something completely different, they continue doing their sums because their attention is, is shifted to other things. So, so many different creative ways in which we can, um, we can begin to think about that. And that's part of what the biomedical communications unit will be doing. So, so just exploring, having ideas. I and mean, a lot of these things are, are quite fun. We have a mentor, um, Professor Mibod is setting up a mentorship bank. So we, we, there's so many people we can call on. And people with different skills, different ideas, we can call on to take, you know, little sessions on things that, you know, people are, people are interested in. I mean, if you said we want to have just a fun workshop, somebody talking about um, um, urology, for example, the connections between urology and making a cake, I know exactly who to call, you know, call Bimba Bolaiwa, and she'll give us, uh, she'll teach. And whatever she teaches, we'll remember, because she's connecting, um, she's connecting art with science. She's connecting, you know, her hobbies and her passions with science, and it makes things more memorable. So it's just exploring lots of different ways of, 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 of creating that message. But the first thing is for the curriculum to say, this is the space for it. This is, there's room, and maybe the room is in teachings, and you leave sort of a placeholder for creative exploration. And then we experiment and iteratively we work through it. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Oshini, for responding to those uh, questions. I, let me quickly also um, add a few points that I know. Uh, I know that over the time, for instance, in the in the in the past, um, in this within this short time that uh, uh, we've uh, uh, interacted with students in, uh, at this level. 
we have noted, for instance, it's a little bit of um, disturbing trend whereby students are um, not even able to communicate appropriately with uh, members of the faculty. So I could relate with um, you probably at that time as a 19 year old girl uh, being confronted with um, a real life situation where you needed to, those are some of the things we may not necessarily pick from the classrooms, but uh, sometimes you may need a lot of experience to be able to deal with. But more recently, we noted that the uh, students generally had issues with even communicating, the way they even write to, to, to interact with um, lecturers and so on is very disturbing. They write like they're writing their friends and, and things like that. You know, so we, we, we thought that really, and one of the reasons, I mean, I, I remember at one of the one of such moments, uh, the provost was making reference to to your series that um, you know a, a lot of issues about uh, have um, degenerated a little bit, and uh, we know that students have even difficulties with communication, simple communication, even with uh, members of staff, not to talk about dealing with real life events with um, with patients. But uh, apart from that, we also know that, I, I know very well that the curriculum as it is, and I'm sure those who are involved in the curriculum review for various programs will um, readily uh, 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 agree to this, is the fact that we see each of the curricula of, I mean, most of those curricula of the different programs has already filled up completely. And you really wonder if there's actually any room for any additions of anything, you know, even though while we keep understanding world more, we notice the need to have several other uh, parts of life incorporated into the curriculum. But the thing is that whatever we do, and no matter what, the day does not change from 24 hours to 36 hours. It does not change. And that essentially may never be able to change. So what we need to do is that what, what the, 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 uh, the bother here is that, okay, why we think we'll need to address some of these um, innovations or creativities into the curriculum, then you want to begin to shrink the already existing ones. I mean, something has to give way, except that, except if we have noted that there's a time when, um, there's a time where there, there's, there's somewhere in the curriculum where there's space that has not been allocated, you know? So it's, it's a little bit of worry. And this, well, it's at some point, we don't, we don't envy those who are really involved in the review of curriculum. There are so many other things they want to bring in, but really they have um, a lot of uh, space constraint. Now that probably will now give room to the need to probably look at other opportunities to be, begin, begin to bring in this um, additional input into the, into the training of a total student. For instance, um, I know that, again, we've been talking about, we have a, uh, a committee that we call the Student Welfare Committee. And we've been talking about how the committee is over the, I mean, very soon is going to take over probably trying to harness all the other um, uh, skills that students have. We recognize, as a, as a matter of fact, Provost herself has several other skills. She can play, she's, I mean, a lot, she's multi-instrumentalist in herself. So, um, and those are the kind of things she, she wants to encourage to ensure that every skill, if you, a student is good with tie and die making, a student is good in shoemaking, a student is good in playing this music or things like that. She wants to harness all of those ones. They are never meant to go down the drain in, a, in the development of a total student. So maybe part of what they were not thinking about, of course the curriculum is going to pick whatever is possible, but whatever, I mean, in the case of um, a constraint in time, then we will now begin to look at other opportunities, other evening times and so on, where such skills can now, I mean, the students can be brought over to display. For instance, we had a program last, I think, a week or less than two weeks ago, where we honored um, uh, a retired first head of department of hematology, Professor Lucio Lizato, who came in from, from Italy. And uh, at the evening of, um, that we had a, a reception evening for a cocktail for him, we got students who performed. Uh, apparently, many people who were at that event thought we hired a band. 
we didn't hire a band. They were just students. They were postgraduate students in the College of Veterans of Abroad. They performed, they played the guitar, played the keyboard, and sang. They sang all through, not replacing any tune or music the second time. Several you know, lyrics they were putting out there. You know, and that was it. So, um, and you know, we have, for instance, we also talk about students writing. We're talking about students coming to write our news items. We have a lot of programs in the in the college. So, we want to encourage now. We're going to begin that program very soon to have students constitute them to writing clubs. They have writing clubs in their hostels. For instance, if you go to APH, you see the wall lined with several notice boards where students write. That's writing for their own. Uh, peers, but we want to have them to begin to write news items for the College of Medicine. And we are working on that, and that is going to come on board very soon. So there are a lot of opportunities to develop students, and I believe that that interaction between medical sciences and the other sciences, many other sciences or arts or humanities, when they come together, then they bring the best out of every individual. So, oh, um, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. so um, do we have any other comments, questions? Uh, yes, I'm just reviewing the comments and I say thank you. Thank you to um, Samuel Jai who says I should have a look at the yearbook to feel students' dispositions. Um, I will certainly do that. Um, I know one of the part of the ethos of the college is that free flow conversation between students and the college is always important to be listening. Sometimes the conversation might not be verbal. It might just be you know, having an ear to the ground, hearing what they are saying. So thank you for that suggestion. We can have creative, creative societies. First of all, Mark says we can have creative societies in the college, which could meet in the evenings or weekends. Yes, absolutely. And especially knowing that that is encouraged by the college might even make some people who are a bit, um, you know, worried about it. It might encourage them because sometimes they might think they're doing something wrong or that they're being distracted. But knowing that the college actually encourages, you know, recreation um, it would be really helpful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hoshini. So um, distinguished um, senior colleagues and colleagues you have, and uh, students, any other questions before we close this session, which is um, incidentally the last of the uh, series? We cannot thank Dr. Hoshini enough, but I don't want to go into that now because I don't want her to go just yet. So um, any other questions or comments? All right. Um, well, uh, like um, has been mentioned, please uh, take advantage of the videos that have been uploaded. And uh, we're going to do a release and uh, attach all the links again for individuals, including myself. The ones I have missed, I can, I can go back on the YouTube and, and watch because um, this is really very, very great. These are the kind of um, uh, education you do not get Really, from 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 the from classrooms and they form part of what makes us what we are in the journey of life. So uh, thank you so much. Um, so please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's take advantage of the videos. They are right there on YouTube, and I've clicked the links that Dr. Oshini shared. I've clicked all of them. They are all working, and um, so please let's take advantage of that. Well, um, so in the absence of um, any other comments or questions, um, sincerely, I, I don't know how we're going to thank you, um, Dr. Buki Hosheni. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very intimidating what we have rolled out in six um, lecture series. And uh, the reality is that if we are going to quantify this into uh, monetary terms, it's, it's, definitely something we may not uh, be able to afford. I, I don't want to be preemptive, but I assume that we have had this all. Uh, <laughs> and I know <laughs> I'm, I, yes. I, I'm just praying you won't go and hand over to us a bill, but I, I <laughs> can I show you there's, there's no bill. Uh, we're, we're, we're so grateful, really very, very grateful. Um, please, just a minute. Um,
Okay, in the meantime, I'm looking at a comment just coming in as a theatre group in ABH at the time. I think that theatre group, I think it's still running. Um, yes, the fantastic theatre, so much theatre so, going on in ABH. I'm that. so sorry, I, a call came in and um, so, I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so um, you were saying something, Dr. Oshini. Yes, I was just referring to a comment about theatre in ABH. Okay. Um, that the celebration required for the arts may help in learning by the students. It's just a very mm. interesting comment. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, thank you very much once again. I thank all members of the faculty who have attended in the past and those, those who have attended some of the series and especially our, our very senior uh, members of faculties who have uh, attended all, all, all the series. We, we are so grateful. And um, Dr. Oshini, I believe that when next we call on you, uh, you know, you'll be willing and um, to support us. I believe there will be so many other things we'll need to do going forward. Like you mentioned casually at some point, you mentioned the biocommunications uh, center of the college. That's one unit that is undergoing uh, a very heavy revamp, and uh, I'm sure uh, in the next um, couple of months, uh, there's going to be a, a totally new um, center where we're going to have a highly digitalized uh, uh, center. We are working on that, God helping us. So uh, I believe, I mean, in, in the very minimum, something will come up where you will, I mean, be able to assist us with a lot of several uh, issues related to uh, what you do very well to with, with, with your medical uh, practice. Um, so do you have any other things you would like to say to us before? Not, not just use? thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, so much for, for, the, for, for attending the sessions. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Oshini. God bless you. We are so, so grateful. Thank you. Please let's, wherever we are, we can switch on our microphone and let's give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> well done, uh, Dr. Wosheni. I'm just- The provost is here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm going oh, by the oh, market, plenty of traffic. <laughs> oh my. Thank you, ma. Yes. Thank you so much. So we, lo we look forward, I mean, like I said, we are really looking out to our alumni around the world to come on as faculty and um, um, as uh, adjunct um, lecturers to come and work with us. And I know that we have you there and we'll be working on th that issue in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Bukid. Bye.